through this very brief introduction period, which by the way is taking longer than we had in our schedule because there are more of us than we were anticipating, that you've had an opportunity to, to find out a little bit about everyone else who's here in this room together, and that you might be able to be hearing some similar problems to yours, and that that will give you an opportunity to figure out who you might like to work with during the workshop section of this, of this morning. So while Martha is digesting my problems, we're trying to create five groups which are then going to be led uh, by the three of us and also by my two colleagues that you met up here at the front, Marco and Giovanni. We're going to be breaking up into groups, but first of all, the two of us um, are going to start presenting a bit of the theory behind this and also a very practical toolbox which you have on the back here we're going to be going through uh, on slides. So um, we have a very diverse group here, and I know that we have everyone from the IT person to um, the small museum just wanting to get started on social media, which means that we have a, a range of experiences, which is very helpful because we're going to be able to help each other when we do form these groups. Um, it also means that some of the things I'm going to be mentioning you've heard before. Uh, but that's okay. So what are we getting to? Uh, people, places, and things. It's a workshop with a long hashtag. Uh, but we were, we were talking about how we can break down all the interactions that happen within the museum space um, and very much within life. And in the end, it all comes down to people, places, and things. If you think about that for a while. Now, I'll let you do that tonight. Um, <laughs> but so how do we get people to interact with places or with things or other possible cross combinations of them. And I have this idea that if you're well informed and if you know all the tools um, to start addressing problems, then you're going to be able to solve the problem. So basically the idea of this workshop is we're going to look at a series of communication tools and we're going to be applying these to our problems. And all those problems have to do with people, places, or things, right? So let's bring up the communications toolbox. We have this. Um, it's also went out on a tweet, so you all have that, and you'll be um, seeing it online. We have this. Um, what we've done is this is a pretty simplified. Um, grouping of some of the tools that are available to us for our museum communication. Um, we've divided them up as the social media tools, mobile related tools, Google tools, because there's so many of them, and the kind of some miscellaneous stuff that I couldn't figure out, but it's all very important. Um, so we're going to go over each of these groupings, if I can, way, um, starting from some of the most basic ones. And in your work, book here on the, this page, you also have a list of some of the, just sort of an idea of some of the cool things you can do with these tools. We're then also going to go into a few case studies that we found particularly interesting uses of these tools afterwards. Um, I'm not going to read through this, I'm going to just talk a little bit about some of these social media, um, sh um, show up against how many of you are using social media for your institution or for a, a work, in a work way. So um, probably you're all familiar with these words. Um, there are some powerful tools behind, or I, I would say some of these social media are more powerful tools than some of us realize. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do with Facebook, with Twitter, uh, with Instagram that you may not know, uh, but I do encourage all of you to start exploring what you can do with these if you haven't um, done so already. For example, Pages has a lot of advantages over just the personal profile. It's hopefully, uh, very few institutions in this room are still using a personal profile, um, but I know that that is something that some Italian museums even are, are still at. Uh, but Facebook Pages uh, allows you to have a lot of statistics about your users, and then that helps you guide um, your programming and your communication. And uh, it also allows you to program your posts, so you can schedule when things come out. And this means that for small museums who are starting out and are, are afraid about the time that it takes to uh, start animating a social media challenge, knowing that you can program everything ahead of time, you don't have to always be there, 
is a really important thing. So if you didn't know that, you please do keep that in mind. Um, that's basically a summary of the, the basics. And you've got a, I don't want to take too much time on it. Google, Google is fantastic. I think Martha's a bigger Google expert than us. Um, one of the things that I didn't know about Google Maps is that you can actually um, design audio tours over them. Um, so Google provides a number of free tools. You can explore some of those. Um, Google Glass is a miraculous new object that we, some of us heard about yesterday afternoon in Neil Sumo's speech. Uh, Google Art Project is uh, a project actually that I don't is going to get into in her presentation later, so I'm not going to bring it up too much, but basically you can get Google to do a virtual tour within your museum with their street view te technology. So uh, that's a way to bring virtual visitors in. I might be a solution for the Anne Frank House. Mobile, um, again, this is something that's been addressed for this conference, so some of you will have um, addressed looked into that uh, through some of the workshops, but there's a lot of options <coughs> available um, with mobile devices now that so many users do have them, although with the, the constant problem that not all users have them, uh, so that, that's something to, to uh, consider. Uh, but there's a lot of things that you can do from geolocated tours uh, to just very, very simple audio guides, which could be set off with a QR code. Um, or data insertion, we also saw a case study about this, um, getting people to tag objects and help you catalog them. These are all options that you can explore with MoMA. Um, I'm going to actually stop a little bit longer with this miscellaneous, because there's uh, a couple of interesting tools here. The MailChimp, um, does anyone know what MailChimp is? Okay, perfect, excellent. Uh, MailChimp is a, is a newsletter um, Platform, so you can send out newsletters to that whole list of emails that, uh, that you've collected over the years. And um, for a small museum in particular, that's very useful because under a certain number, it's free. Uh, and, then, uh, and it helps land emails in people's <coughs> uh, inboxes so that you're not sending out big, big textual uh, newsletters. So it's, uh, it's also pretty inexpensive. And with all this new digital technology, and we're all talking mobile and stuff, the fact is that a lot of our visitors are still using email much more so than they're using Facebook, especially the older crowds. So uh, if we can reach them through email, we cannot forget that absolutely essential tool. Uh, immersive visualization, this is like a step um, <laughs> into another world, and we're going to be looking at this, an expert in immersive visualization here. Europeana, this is something that Stefani has brought to the table. Um, do you want to explain briefly what Europeana is? It's a large database on European collections. So it's a very big pro European project where uh, all the museums around Europe and all cultural institutions can bring their stuff and collect uh, in a way that all the collections from Europe can. Uh, Got to the other and exchange things. And beyond one page, so that yeah. uh, a visitor of one digital collection. Yeah, it's free, I mean. Yes, yeah, it's free. Yeah, exactly. So it's an opportunity for smaller collections to get known um, by collaborating through this database uh, with all sorts of other uh, museums and other things. Um, WordPress is a, it started out as a blogging platform, but really it's a platform on which to build websites. and. I think any idea that I have, I then think, is there a plugin for that? Because WordPress is enhanced by plugins. And so if you think about the functionality that you want, chances are you'll find a WordPress plugin that'll do that, uh, which means that for free or almost free, you can do a lot to extend uh, a website. So you don't really need brilliant IT. <laughs> um, you can do a certain amount with, with these things as well. So, in fact, I believe um, yes. Art, Art Loves is a WordPress application, but we're still in time to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, But Art Maps is a really interesting project that was presented yesterday. I don't know if you want to just briefly mention how. Uh, well, in fact, it relates people, places, and things. Uh, yes. So <laughs> it is very complicated. Uh, it relates to a collection, uh, which is 70,000 artworks to places around the world, and the relationship between an artwork and a place is very subjective, so we have tried to keep it open as much as possible, so that we crowdsource information about the artwork's location, but uh, we allow some room for, for this to be subjective. Mm -hmm. And it's all based on a WordPress application, it's a blogging application practically. 
So that's, that's if I had heard about that before yesterday, this would have been a case study. Really <laughs> it's really, I was very excited about that. Um, Kickstarter, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Storify, does anyone know what Storify is? We got one, and the study of Museo did a Storify already of the first day uh, of this conference. Storify allows you to draw content that's been shared on social media around whatever topic you want and create it into a single article. Uh, so it's a kind of collaborative article writing tool. Uh, and then Eventbrite, this is just another free and easy to use tool if you're holding events in your area um, at your, your museum. It's a way to get people to sign up um, for tickets. And it also, being a database that's location based, it suggests to people, so I'm registered in Eventbrite in Florence, I get a regular email from Eventbrite that says, these are events happening in your area and that your friends are going to. Which means that, uh, again, for a smaller institution, that's a useful tool um, because you just reaching your direct audience may not reach as many people as all those people registered for that location on Eventbrite. So some, um, what you may have noticed is that most of the tools that are on this toolbox are free. Um, so it doesn't take huge budgets, nor necessarily large staff. Um, and that's the concept behind what we're doing. So we're looking at as many free, open source, and easy to use tools as possible to start addressing our problems. Oh yeah, makers. Um, we, we also have to talk a fair amount about makers in this conference. Um, and some of you may have seen the makers corner downstairs in the demonstration room. Um, makers movement, this is uh, basically digital artisans who are using some of these new technologies. We just uh, spoken a lot about 3D printing and the possibilities of that uh, within the museum, so we'll spend it longer on that. 3D printing is um, the maker tool that's getting the most attention these days, but it's not the only one. Um, and laser cutting, for example, is, is a little bit easier to use. It's a little easier to make laser cut objects than it is to, to, to develop them in three dimensions. With laser cutting, um, you can easily create two-dimensional or even three-dimensional if you um, build them upwards. Objects that can be used, for example, um, very well in museum education. So if you um, need to create games, for example, you could do that by developing um, wooden or um, plexiglass objects that, that can then be used in your museum education department. <laughs> wow, that's very intimate. Um, it's a little small. Um, and moving on to the <coughs> case studies. Okay, we need that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, no problem. We're going to talk about a couple of case studies here. Um, I want to talk about things that you can do with crowds. So once you already have an established public, um, particularly digital, but not necessarily, there's, there's some interesting things you can do. There was a section on um, crowdsourcing yesterday, but we didn't go through the whole history of it. Um, so we just looked at some more modern uh, applications. So crowd concepts. Um, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and crowd curation. These are kind of catchwords. Um, can I just see who's heard of uh, Crowdsourcing, okay. Crowdfunding. Who here has run a crowdfunding campaign? <coughs> okay, crowd curation. Anyone done any run a crowd curation? Okay, so these are things you can do when you have people. Um, crowdsourcing is a term that comes from business basically means um, you're not going to do it all yourself, but you're going to ask people to contribute to it. There's platforms online uh, that allow you to do this and that often address large scientific problems or large economic problems uh, in a general sense. Uh, when you bring crowdsourcing into the museum, um, you have slightly different results. Crowdfunding, I'm going to get to that in a second, sorry. Um, crowdfunding means you can ask people for money. Um, and it's, it's simply a way of collecting small donations from a larger number of people. So in this period of economic crisis, crowdfunding is actually attracting a lot of money for the arts where large donors are hard to find. Uh, the largest example, I believe still, uh, is that of Louvre, who um, needed 4 million euros to purchase this crown act and raised 1.26 million from 5,000 private donors. Their goal was 1 million. Uh, so they actually raised more than they intended. Uh, and this they did on a, on a platform that they developed on their own website. 
Um, and just more recently, this was in, in 2010, uh, whereas a campaign that just closed more recently is another million euros that they raised for um, the restoration of the UK from 6,700 donors. If you are not the Louvre and you're not building your own crowdfunding website, that's okay. Um, in that there are platforms, a number of platforms, at least a dozen, uh, available online that um, do take a percentage of, of what you raise. And these basically work like this. Kickstarter and Indiegogo are two of the largest um, and often most successful camp uh, platforms that you can use to run your own crowdsourcing campaign. Kickstarter, you have to be based in the United States, the UK, um, Canada, I believe, and perhaps Australia. So it hasn't reached uh, Italy and Europe yet. Um, and what Kickstarter does is you set a campaign goal, and then as people donate, you have to reach that goal to get that money. If you don't get it, you don't get the whole pot of, of money. Whereas Indiegogo has that function, but it also has um, the not all at all or nothing version. So you can just raise the say my goal is 5,000, but if you don't reach that 5,000, you still get the money. Um, so that can be a really slightly more useful resource for arts institutions. And there is no restriction for using Indiegogo in European countries. Um, so it's, it's, it's easy to get your money out of their platform. So that's a good one to know about. Um, and you can search and find a number of successful arts related or museums related um, campaigns. So if you just do a quick search for the word museum on these things, you can see what's worked uh, in the past. And there's a, it's a lot of work to, to do this kind of campaign um, and that you have to really push the marketing. You have to really um, reach out to all your public and, and try to get them to donate. But once you do have an established digital public, this is a really great thing you can do with them. Crowdsource curation, this was a lot bigger um, when I ran this on the Mac. Um, crowdsource curation is the act of outsourcing part of the curatorial process to an online or offline community. Um, this community helps select artworks that may be displayed, accessioned or deaccessioned, um, or mm, part, of, part of an exhibition. So the crowd takes over part of the curatorial role. Um, any curators in the room may be fainting at this point. Um, <laughs> it, it is, however, <laughs> not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> so what Browser's curation does is it's, it's a, it's a trade-off uh, in that it may not produce the best exhibits ever because you are act, asking the general public to help you make choices in an exhibition. Um, so that, that may produce results that are uh, maybe not exactly what you wanted, but uh, it tends to be a payoff in terms of engagement. So um, the, the dark reaction of people who have been participating in crowdsource curation feel that the museum or the exhibition or the artworks is really more um, belongs to them. And so they like to see themselves reflected back in the museum. This is part of uh, a social community, so it's important to, to consider this. I could talk a lot longer, but I need to pass over the, the stage. I just want to show you the first crowdsource curation exhibit. Um, so if you didn't know about the Brooklyn Museum's Click, you can look it up, find a lot of information on their website. That was back in 2008. Um, that starts off a trend, although really there hasn't been that many. There's really been about two dozen um, crowdsource curation exhibits in art museums since then. Um, and the first one in Italy it was My Vintage. Uh, which Flaud ran, ran for the Museo del Tessuto here in Prato, so a small museum. And this is where I just wanted to encourage um, those of us who are thinking about what you can do in a small museum. You don't need to have a huge budget or amazing technological ability to do something like this or to do a number of other things that we're going to be talking about in this workshop. Um, so we ask people to express their idea of vintage with a photograph and send it in. Those photographs were then uh, restituted to the museum space, so they were printed and displayed within the museum. And then an online vote 
uh, allowed those photo the more important photographs, the ones that got more votes, to grow. So we then reprinted the photographs, and this was right at the beginning, but as the exhibit went on, the photographs grew on the wall, reflecting, uh, so digital reflected into the real space. And this didn't cost very much at all because we had um, a sponsor who was taking care of the printing and also other sponsors donating prizes. So it cost basically nothing running on a WordPress platform. That's it for my case studies, and we'll pass on to the more advanced case studies.